Hi, I'm Tom Payton, director and publisher of Trinity University Press. Thank you for joining us for this Dear America Town Hall event. It's the last in the series, unfortunately. Since spring, hundreds of people have gathered monthly to visit with a diverse cross-section of contributors to the new book, Dear America, Letters to Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy. With a patriotic spirit, hundreds of writers, artists, scientists, and community leaders have come together to offer their impassioned words through Terrain.org's Letters to America project, now collected in this book. In the Dear America Town Halls, we explore different themes about the natural environment, violence and injustice, and activism and protest, all focused on reconciling conflicting political and social perspectives, reconsidering moral imperatives, and inspiring meaningful change, of course. As a mission-driven organization, Trinity publishes each book with great intentionality. We're proud of all of them. But it's rare that a book has true urgency, and Dear America provides us with a keenly timed roadmap of sorts, a call to action for the challenging times in which we live. Tonight's event is also live streamed on Facebook. Along with the previous town halls, it is archived at the Trinity University Press webpage, tupress.org. The print and ebook is available at your favorite neighborhood or online retailer, but it is also available right now at a special price for you at dearamericabook.org. In light of the current times, please consider buying additional copies to perhaps share with your family, neighbors, colleagues, or even a donation to your local library. This is a book we need to, need to read right now to help us calmly yet honestly assess where we are and have hope for the future alone and together. Now, speaking of being together, it's my pleasure to introduce Simmons Bunton, Terrain.org Editor-in-Chief and one of the three editors of the book. Simmons will guide the discussion tonight and the other two book editors, Elizabeth Dodd and Derek Sheffield, will join him later. Thanks again for being with us. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Tom, and welcome everyone. Good evening. I'm joining you from Tucson, Arizona the ancestral and current lands of the Tohono O'odham Nation and the Pascua Yaqui, as well as the ancestral lands of the Apache, Hopi, and Zuni. It is my honor and our duty to acknowledge their occupied territories. Thank you. I am delighted to host tonight's town hall with such amazing writers and citizens. And on behalf of myself and my wonderful co-editors, Elizabeth and Derek, who are here this evening, welcome. Let me also take a moment here in our last official Dear America Town Hall to thank the amazing team at Trinity University Press, Director Tom Payton, who you just heard, Assistant Editor Stephanie Morris, and Marketing Director Bergen Streetman, most notably, for bringing this beautiful and important book to the world, particularly this year before the election. It has been an honor and a pleasure to work with Tom and Stephanie and Bergen and their team and on behalf of my co-editors and all 130 of our contributors, thank you for your outstanding work, your patience and persistence, your kindness, your community, your vision. Thank you. So as Tom mentioned, Dear America, Letters of Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy is a powerful, diverse, and necessary collection of poetry, prose, and artwork. Of the 130 contributions, 50 were not previously published. These are letters that do not appear in the terrain.org online series. So even if you've read terrain.org regularly, and I know you all have, you'll want a copy of this book. And as Tom mentioned, maybe three or four or five for your closest friends, family members. If you go to dearamericabook.org, you can get 20% off of each copy you purchase. And I think it's important to note too that all royalties go to three nonprofit organizations, Union of Concerned Scientists, Natural Resources Defense Council, and the American Civil Liberties Union. And this portal, dearamericabook.org, is the way to maximize the funds going to these stalwart organizations. Or of course, you can go through the bookseller of your choice, perhaps supporting your local bookstore. Meanwhile, the online series continues. We've published now 198 letters to America over at terrain.org, including most recently by James Howard Kunstler, on the suburban fiasco and the coming salvage economy. And last week by 21 year old Whit Jester, whose searing prose letter is not to be missed. The youth of America will not go gently into that good night, she tells us, she shows us, 
And that's a very good thing. And while you're on train.org reading those letters after tonight's events and throughout your entire week, check out a couple new features on the website. First, teachterrain.org, which is a robust resource devoted to helping teachers and community groups use terrain.org as a place-based, ad-free, no-cost resource for education and discussion. We've also recently articulated a statement on racial justice with our commitments to action that we are working on as we speak. And then we have a new call for submissions and note that we're now using submitting. But enough about terrain.org, you know where to find that. Did I mention that's at terrain.org? Let's get to tonight's event, which is titled Real Patriotism, the Art and Activism of Protest. We will read in this order, Deborah Markwork, Sherwin Bitsui, Amy Nezukamatonel, pardon me, and Fenton Johnson. I will introduce each one just before they read. Audience, if you have a question that comes to mind as you listen, please send it through the Q&A button. Then we'll have about 15 minutes or so for conversation at the end of that. And I'm not seeing any questions yet, so queue them up. First, it's my pleasure to introduce Deborah Marquardt, who teaches in Iowa State University's interdisciplinary MFA program in creative writing and environment and in the Stone Coast Low Residency MFA program at the University of Southern Maine. She is Iowa's Poet Laureate and the senior editor of Flyway, Journal of Writing and Environment. The author of six books, Deborah has two books forthcoming in 2021. One titled Gratitude with Dogs Under Stars, New and Collected Poems, and the second is The Night We Landed on the Moon, Essays of Exile and Belonging. Deborah's commitment to teaching makes her unavailable for our live event this evening, I'm afraid. So she has kindly recorded herself reading from the anthology. And so I'm going to play that for you now. Let me share my screen. Hello, everybody. I'm Deb Marquardt. I'm so honored to be here for this reading. And I just wanted to thank the editors, Simmons Bunton and Elizabeth Dodd and Derek Sheffield and all the editors at terrain.org for all the hard work they do bringing this Dear America series and now this amazing anthology. I'm going to read my piece and a couple others as well. This has come November. I wrote this in 2018 out of frustration after the Kavanaugh hearings. And I had this thought that Poems have power, I think. They can go out into the air and do work. And I wrote the poem to try to influence the midterm election. Come November. Come cold eye corrective. Come pendulum. Take wrecking ball to venerable walls. Come cerulean wave. Come typhoon, earthquake, tsunami. Blow the gentlemen from Utah, Iowa, South Carolina, Kentucky, Maine, back to higher ground, or better yet, homeward, to the distant shores that spawned them, washed up, jobless, uninsured. Come classic EF5 tornado, good old Midwestern tradition. Come barn splintering wedge of gale force winds. Come vacuum up this mess of a land. Rip the flimsy scrims from the chambers where black robed justices work their corrupted levers. These days, it's tempting to curse biblical, to call down pestilence, plague, a pox upon both houses and the thundering horse, hooves of horsemen. Instead, embrace November's wintry grip, November come inevitable, November come early and often. Listen, can you hear that ticking like fingertips of sleet upon window panes? It's the clicking of check marks in ballot boxes, the coming blizzard of millions. So let's see if it does anything this November. Let's hope. I wanted to read another piece. Um, you know, so many pandemics going on in this country. We have the actual um, COVID-19 pandemic. We have a pandemic of racism that is erupting, welling up out of where it was um, all these years. It was never gone, but it's showing itself in ever-increasing alarming ways. Um, and this is Leslie Wheeler's The South. 
um, an amazing piece of, ri of writing. And Leslie Wheeler is a potent novelist. The South. Once you knew where you were going, from winter's unambiguous branches through flushing eastern redbud toward the shabby linens of the South, bleaching on dogwood racks, toward manly honor and chaste womanhood, dusted with gunpowder, shaded from heat by genocidal legacies. Not so fast, youth I was, not so neat. Sure, the glass of tea will sweat where tongues grow cool and slow as minted bourbon. Sure, some white shoppers won't stand in the black cashier's line, allow his wrist's revolution to float their collards, or mayonnaise jars over a scanner's bloodshot eye. The hate you'll recognize thinking you can stand to one side, an innocent cartographer. But malice won't sit where you mapped it, emitting a predictable growl. Stop knowing everything and look around. Heat above your banging pulse, an implicated tune, weathered and blue, voice of land, pushed up sore, its grudges cold. Those notes twist down piney slopes, fume into creeks, by whose banks the copperheads sun like slippery hieroglyphs. They scrawl a tale that had been camouflaged from you even as you sang your lines. Now the story holds you in its lap. Now it's poised to strike. So many amazing pieces in this anthology. Just wanted to read this very short piece by Shole Wolpe, who is an Iranian-American poet and playwright. And this is a poem about protecting the rights of immigrants and thinking about making our country a welcome place for immigrants. Dear America, you used to creep into my room, remember? I was 11 and you kept coming night after night in Tehran, slid in from inside the old radio on my desk, past the stack of geometry homework across the faded Persian carpet and thrust into me with rock and roll thumps. I loved you more than bubble gum, more than the imported bananas street vendors sold for a fortune. I thought you were azure, America, and orange like the sky, and poppies like mother's new dress, and kumquats. I dreamed of you, America. I dreamed you every single night with the ferocity of a lost child until you became true like flesh. And when I arrived at you, you punched yourself into me like a laugh. I think of my own grandfathers who came to this country in the early 1900s and the very different reception that they received when they came to America. And I'll close with this amazing piece by Kamiko Han, a um, poem about guarding the future, what we need to do, what rituals to protect the future. And Kamiko is a poet, and she teaches at Queens College, the City University of New York. And this is called The Augury. August 3rd, 2019. Dear America, I will meet him in November in upstate New York, knowing that with great ardor, he will begin to cry. In upstate New York, he will love me and take a breath, and we both begin to cry. No one needs a seer to see. He'll love me and take a breath of the rank air that no one needs a seer to see. He'll not love the ripe water. Complimenting the rank air, thanks to the factory owners, he'll not love the stench concocted by our president. To protect him from factory owners, I'll meet him in November. To protect him from this president, I'll attend his birth. I am his grandmother, Kamiko. Thank you so much. I'm Deb Marquardt.
Thank you, Deborah. That was a beautiful reading. And such uh, beautiful and important poems, so timely still with the most important election in modern history, less than two weeks away, come November indeed. As a reminder, please use the Q&A feature to post questions for consideration following the reading. It's my pleasure now to introduce Sherwin Bitsui, but it is also my sadness to relate that Sherwin had a last minute family emergency and couldn't join us. I'm gonna read his bio and then Derek and Elizabeth are gonna join me in reading his poem and another that he would have read. So let's introduce Sherwin. Sherwin Bitsui is originally from, the White, Cone, from White Cone, Arizona on the Navajo reservation. He is Diné of the Bitter Water Clan born for the Many Goats clan. He is the author of Shape Shift, Flood Song, and Dissolve. His honors include a Lannan Foundation Literary Fellowship and a Native Arts and Culture Foundation Arts Fellowship. He is also the recipient of a 2010 Penn Open Book Award, an American Book Award, and a Whiting Writers Award. He is on faculty at Northern Arizona University. And for those of you who don't know, I'll add that um, Sherwin is really a pretty exceptional photographer, something I had the opportunity to learn uh, just a bit more about when we had the chance to pal around with uh, poet Juan Morales and friend Daniel Dabrowski up in Southern Utah a couple of years ago. Um, and so when Derek reads uh, Sherwin's poem from the book, you will hear, I think, and see that vision that Sherman, that Sherwin has um, in his poem. So Derek, Thank you, Simmons. Um, I have to, and speaking of, of Sherwin reading, <clears throat> it was uh, my pleasure some years ago to, uh, to hear Sherwin read in the company of Simmons and Elizabeth, um, my two excellent co-editors. And if you ever have a chance to uh, attend a Sherwin Bitsui reading, I encourage you to do so. It's uh, it's really a special experience. Um, he has a, a lot of the poetry is memorized. It's very incantatory and, um, and, and mystical, I would, I would even say. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really special um, to, to see that live. And um, so, yeah, so I'm going to read Sherwin's poem, um, Sending Good Thoughts to Him and His Family Tonight. Um, and also just wanted to thank you all for being with us. Um, we can see your delightful names and uh, there's, a, there's just a lot of wonderful people out there, some pretty incredible writers and editors who have joined us tonight, so thank you. I'm um, gonna read you a, a poem called World, A World Departs. And I read this poem to you after um, about a month of breathing wildfire smoke from Oregon and California. And I read this to you as we head into a winter um, that may not bring surcease from the fire season. California is looking at the possibility of um, like fire season year round now. So this is a world departs from Sherwin Bitsui. Flames, 30 degrees warmer, become leaves rustling in an autumn dream. We rename sharpened shadows with shadow light, climb beads of gunshots backlit on cliff tops, then dive into our hands, holding our teeth back. When butterflies drizzle, spit, and float out our ears. We trace a hearse breathing up through our footsteps, the plastic wrapped moon's jaw locked around its sweating, never again snow peaked. Thank you so much, Derek, for reading Sherwin's poem. And Elizabeth, you're going to read a poem for us now as well. Yes, thank you. 
This is a poem that Sherwin had selected and had planned to read also from the anthology. Um, and as Derek said, um, sending good thoughts to uh, Sherwin Bitsui and his family. This poem is called After His Election, I Make a Zen Garden by Gary Soto. A pie tin, five cups of sand, a thimble with water, a dry branch, a cotton ball worth of moss, river pebbles and polished stone, maybe a small shell, maybe glass roughed up by the sea. And by noon, I have a garden. Let me go inside a tree for the next few years. I offer a spring blossom to my creation. I hum a three syllable chant. I rake the sand and dip my pinky into the thimble. So this is the taste of Buddha mind. This is my garden after the election. This is my sanctuary on a windowsill, a monk-like ant trekking the ledge. A stick of incense is lit, the dead remembered. I feel a terrible force at work, a hundred days in office, not enough sand to bury his deeds. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks to Sherwin for being a part of the anthology. And even though he couldn't join us here this evening, I think he knows that we're all thinking about him and his family. It's my pleasure now to introduce Amy Nazuka Matadal, who is the author of World of Wonders in Praise of Fireflies, Whale Sharks, and Other Astonishments, a finalist for the Kirkus Prize in Nonfiction. And hey, you can find an excerpt of that on terrain.org. But after the reading, please. She's also the author of four books of poetry. Honors include fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. She's a professor of English in the University of Mississippi's MFA program. And before um, she reads this evening, I want to mention or remind folks that uh, we'd love to see your questions in the Q&A, so feel free to submit those. And so, and I, and I promise you this was not intended to be a trend. Amy also cannot quite join us in person this evening. She sends her regrets, but she has sent us a reading of her passionate letter from Dear America, and I'm going to cue that up now. I'm Amy Nizuka Matatil, and I'm here in Oxford, Mississippi, and I'm going to read a selection um, from my piece in this anthology. I'm so grateful to Terrain and Trinity University Press for putting this out there in the world, and um, I've never read this fully out loud before, uh, so this is going to be dedicated to my parents, Paz and Matthew, the most patriotic people I know in the best, truest sense of the word. This is called Something Like Tenderness. I was born a snapdragon from a burst of seeds not cleaned by a rabbit escaping a fox. When our skull-shaped seed pods are crispy and ready to shake, they spit seed. And when the fox had his catch by the neck, I could do nothing but grow tipped to light in a bit of blood rain. America, I am your good brown friend. For many of you, I am the only brown friend you have. How I love being your good brown friend. Very good, very brown. Many of you tell me you don't see color as if we're colorless, transparent, or rather as if we're clear like Zima, Pepsi clear, hair gel, a varnish, a seltzer, gloss. A few years ago in Florida, my Catholic Indian father had a full can of pop thrown at his head from a pickup truck. 40 years before he retired as an award-winning and patient favorite respiratory therapist, my father has helped mostly white geriatric folks and white NICU babies breathe. He's missed some of my sisters and my birthdays, plays, concerts, and tennis matches because he was helping white people breathe. He was helping white people 
breathe. He helped white people breathe even when his eldest daughter pouted why he missed yet another one of her tennis matches. He helped white people breathe for over 40 years. America, for over 40 years before she retired from being an acclaimed psychiatrist, my mother was helping mostly white people with their mental health, suffering verbal and sometimes physical assault from her unstable patients. And still, my parents worked those jobs, even when the very people they were taking care of screeched racist slurs right to their faces. Yes, my parents received paychecks, but they didn't have to stay in those often rural places where they needed, where they were needed the most. They could have stayed in big cities with even bigger paychecks. But they love small town America, even when it doesn't love them back. They love small town America, even when it doesn't love them back. They love small town America, even when it doesn't love them back. I know many of you don't interact with many brown people, and why is that? And, I'm, and I know I'm one of your only sources of actual lived experience as a brown woman. And again, why is that? And I'm here to say any violence or any harassment towards me and my family was never ever done with someone with brown skin. Senior year in college, I had to go to court to get a restraining order because a white coworker broke into my dorm room several times. The last time I was there sleeping when he broke in. I didn't have my glasses on, so you can imagine my terror. I screamed and screamed for my life. Oh, I, I, I can scream. Oh, wow, how I can scream when I need to save myself. First year grad school, two men who attacked me while I was walking on campus in the middle of a humid morning in Tallahassee during my first year in grad school were white. In the middle of the morning, I was mailing a letter to my parents to tell them I was okay. But it happened on the way back to my apartment after the envelope was safely nestled in the blue mailbox with so many other letters to parents telling them they were okay too. I sometimes wonder what happened to that letter. Did it fly away? My parents told me they never received it. I dropped out the next week and became a waitress in a mall and oh, all the cash I made because I let white men in suits call me honey, call me baby, call me sugar. So much cash, so much honey. But I took it and took it and took it all because I thought I'd never apply again, uh, because I thought I would never apply again to grad schools and at least I'd have fistfuls of cash. I thought my life in words was over. I thought my life in words was over. I thought my life in words was over. And when I go through the horrible Rolodex of awful incidents in my mind, I have to tell you all, I mean, all the times I've been followed or stalked or teased or bullied have been by white men. So forgive me if I laugh at your fear and hatred of brown immigrants. Forgive me when I laugh when you say immigrants are a danger to the fabric of our country. Dear America, I am red clover. Every prick at the edge of a highway makes me consider my own red highway, mapping out very good blood to me here in Mississippi. What a riot of joy to say, in spite of where I was scattered, today I am gathered. I was once scattered and now I am gathered. I am here and growing like a magnolia. Dear America, I am magnolia now, not the white bloom, the sturdy trunk. But I want to start with the milk, 
the cream of late spring, so many saucers spilling in the shadow of the milk moon, the flower moon, the moon of the fragrant month, my oldest child was born. For once, America, here in Mississippi, I don't look over my shoulder. It is possible, even in this place. For once, America, I want to pour something like tenderness back into your hands and your hands and your hands, too. Thank you, Amy, for that beautiful reading. And, uh, you know, thanks to Amy for sharing her story and her experience. Um, and thanks to Amy's parents for their selfless work in an America in which the battle for social and racial and environmental justice is always ongoing. Uh, reminder, you can post some questions in the Q&A if you'd like, and we'll have a discussion after. It's my great pleasure now to introduce my former creative writing teacher, though Fenton continues to guide me through his work and his words and his wisdom to this day, more than a decade since I graduated. An award-winning author of fiction and literary nonfiction, Fenton Johnson lives in San Francisco and Tucson, but is often found hiking his native Kentucky. He leads writing workshops around the country, contributes to Harper's Magazine, and has been featured on Fresh Air. His seventh book, At the Center of All Beauty, Solitude and the Creative Life, recently published by W.W. W. Norton, was listed as New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice. Benton, take us away. Um, thank you. Um, Simmons for that um, kind introduction. And I also want to mention that um, you were the graduate student of um, Allison Hawthorne Deming, who um, started off the whole series. And <clears throat> there is nothing, <laughs> if there was ever an example of the student teaching the teacher, which I say in all of my classes, I always learn more from my students than they learn from me. It is uh, you, and it's really, um, we're really proud to see the anthology proud of Terrain as a publication of the work that you do. Um, I will, uh, oh yeah, add my congratulations to the editors and uh, who have done so much work into Trinity, Unity, uh, Trinity University Press. And uh, I'll add one item uh, to my bio as we were discussing before the program got underway because it might be a rich little detail to inform our discussion later, which is that I have been uh, serving as a volunteer for the Democratic Party poll of, of watching the ballot counting process of the mailed ballots here in um, Arizona. And um, I could have some information to share on that front. So um, I'll read my piece, uh, which is about uh, an election, the election of uh, 2012. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's called My Mother's Vote. Dear America, it's October 2012, and I'm spending the autumn caregiving my 96-year-old mother in the family home in rural Kentucky when she says, so Fenton, who are you voting for for president? Politics and religion being forbidden subjects south of the Ohio, the moment sets itself apart from the norm. I say, I don't know, mother, although I do, but I understand in the way of Southern manners that the subtext of her question is, ask me who I'm voting for. And so I ask and she responds, I think I'll vote for this Obama guy. You will? I'm shocked out of manners, which takes quite a shock since my mother understood early that manners were the only gifts she could afford to give her children, and so, she, and so she drilled them in deep. My mother, born in 19, 1916 into the Jim Crow South, my mother, who like most of the women of my childhood, adopted the formulation nigra as a genteel linguistic compromise between the impermissible Yankee Negro and the men's unspeakable N-word. And then I shut my mouth. I want desperately to know the forces that brought her to this decision, but the moment seems too fragile. I'm afraid something I will say will change her mind. And so I leave the moment alone. 
Across the next several weeks, I seize every opportunity to say, if she wants to vote, I'll figure out a way to make that happen. She's pretty infirm. But she puts me off and dodges the question and puts me off until it's election day. I have a full day of errands. So over breakfast, I say, now's your last chance, because if I'm taking you to the polls, you have to let me know so I can get back here in time, since Kentucky closes its polls at an absurdly early 6 p.m. No, she says firmly, I'm too old to vote. Okay, well, whatever, I say, and go about my errands and return around 5.30 to find my mother <laughs> struggling to push open the door with her walker. Where are you going, I ask. I've got to get down there to vote, she says. <laughs> the polling place is a mile distant. All right, I say, let's get you in the car. I get to the polling place at 5.50 and screech to a halt in front of the door and get my mother into her walker. She turns out to be registered in Mitch McConnell's wet dream of a polling place. There's a step to negotiate, a hazard and a barrier for the disabled, but I get her over that and inside, only to find that the booths are at the far end of the high school gym, 50 yards and more away, and are flimsy aluminum stands that provide no purchase or support. The polling volunteers all know my mother and offer a table and chair for her to vote, but there are no chairs with arms, only folding metal chairs that are more hazardous for an elderly, elderly person than the booth. I have no choice but to accompany her to the booth so that she can lean on my arm, though this feels a bit like sitting in on someone's confession. The ballot is set in a typeface that would, that would require a 20-year-old to use a magnifying glass, and the voting booth provides the weakest of reading lights. So I take the ballot and read aloud the names, slowly and without inflection. And when I say Barack Obama, she says, I'm voting for him. I read the rest of the names, but at the end she says, Obama. So I show her the box and she makes an X. And I'm near to tears at witnessing this demonstration of how, despite all evidence to the contrary, and the magnitude of the powers arrayed, arraigned, arraigned against it, change, positive change, affirmative change can happen. My mother, 96 years old, voting for an African-American, take that, Mitch McConnell. But instead of weeping, I point out that she can't just make an X. It's a computer form and she has to black in the whole box. QED, a living demonstration of why, of why Al Gore lost Florida in 2000. So leaning heavily on my arm, she blacks in the box and I leave her standing in her walker as I cross the additional 100 feet to the machine where I turn in her ballot. Some years back, I pointed out to a dear friend that much could be inferred from the fact that the United States chose as its national symbol, the bald eagle, a bird that uses its size and power to steal food from smaller, more skilled animals who track and kill the prey. A bully and a thief, I wrote. An opportunist, she fired back. You will not be surprised to learn that she voted for Donald Trump. My lefty liberal friends moan that they don't see how any intelligent person could vote for Donald Trump. In response, I offer the suggestion with which William James opens his magisterial, magisterial essay on pacifism, the moral equivalent of war. Quote, Path pacifists ought to enter more deeply into the aesthetical and ethical point of view of their opponents. Do that first in any controversy, then move the point and your opponent will follow. Every Trump, voter, every Trump voter, every Trump voter of my acquaintance, and I, I have a big family in rural Kentucky, I know a lot of them. Every Trump voter of my acquaintance was a college graduate who disliked the man intensely, but A, felt ignored by the Washington, New York, Boston, Silicon Valley elite of the Obama, pres the, the Obama presidency so carefully cultivated. B, fell victim to the Republican Party's 30 year smear campaign Trump's lies and Hillary Clinton's inability to redefine the tone of their encounter, and C was insulted by Hillary Clinton's repeated insistence that anyone who'd voted for who'd vote for Donald for Trump was racist and quote deplorable end quote. 
college biology taught them inaccurately, as it turns out, that quote, survival of the fittest, unquote, that's a phrase from actually from um, Herbert Spencer, not Darwin, um, is, is nature's only measuring rod. And they believe that in a world that capitalism is constantly telling them is dangerous, fear, fear sells even better than sex, we need a president who is as nasty and manipulative and bullying as they are. That there is no readily identifiable they only increases my friend's fears. But that biology now teaches that successful evolution requires cooperation and collaboration as much as competition is a message science is not doing nearly enough to disseminate. The challenge is great, maybe insurmountable. Any critique of the 2016 election must begin with a reminder that Hillary Clinton comfortably won the popular vote and in a real, in, in a real sense achieved, in fact, a historic victory. But the slave owners of 1789 demanded and got a system that awarded them disproportionate power. With the concentration of the liberal vote in a few states, we are likely to see more elections like 2000 and 2016 with ever increasing popular vote victories combined with ever larger electoral college losses. Perhaps we are witnessing the, the disintegration of the American empire which if that could be accomplished peacefully might be for the best. But if the empire is to remain united, our work begins not with the presidential election of 2020, but with the school board and state representative and county sheriff elections of 2017 and 2018. Over and over, I hear the question, how do we respond? Let me rephrase the question, where were you on election day? I went down to the local Democratic headquarters and made a few calls. Nice try, but it was wholly inadequate to the cause. Watch and wait. Keep your wits about you. Stay calm. The great mistake of the Hillary Clinton campaign was engaging Donald Trump on his playing field of insult and ugliness. We can't win on that field. Let the thieves fall out as they will while we gather our strength and organize. Recognize that while social media has its uses, Facebook and Twitter do not a successful campaign make. Why did my mother change her mind about going to the polls? Because on election day, a volunteer called her to ask if, ask if she had voted. Campaigns are won by shaking hands, knocking on doors, giving money, making phone calls, coming together, FaceTime. As Obama and Trump taught us in different ways, there's no substitute for enthusiasm. Can I yell and scream and wave signs for social justice? You bet I can. Where might the left accomplish that? Once we had labor unions and union halls and first rate regional media, newspapers and locally owned television. Now we have churches. Get off your lazy weekend ass and join a liberal church or your local democratic party or your local environmental organization or something, some place where you can come together with other like-minded people working for social justice. Turn off your dumbed down devices, pull out your earbuds and connect, only connect. Come together to revere each other and the planet. For every homophobic, misogynistic megachurch, there are three struggling left-wing congregations or temples dedicated to loving kindness and fellowship where talk of God, if it happens, is undertaken in the most general neutral, gender neutral, user friendly way and whose leaders are within the bounds of their tax free status, eager to promote candidates who share your views. Attend a Quaker meeting house and learn about nonviolent resistance. Define and honor your limits of action and then stretch them just a little bit in doing what you can. Prepare to put your body where your heart is. Action is the best way to stir yourself from the dumps. Don't underestimate the power of love. Get out there and do something subversive. This is a good moment to mention the two Tohono O'odham women who laid down in front, laid down in front of the bulldozers in the, um, in the uh, National Monument, uh, the, um, uh, I'm having an eight, the, the, the 
Organ Pipe National Monument a few weeks ago to stop the building of the wall. Carry this truth close to your heart. The closer the victory, the stronger the resistance, unless of course we give up. Okay, so roll your eyes. Don't join a liberal church. Don't head down to Democratic head headquarters or your lefty nonprofit of choice. Instead, spend your Sundays at home on Facebook, send lots of tweets and lose elections. Take your pick. The struggle is unending as it should be. Think of Frederick Douglass, born a slave, who endured the Civil War and the 13th Amendment that ended slavery, then witnessed the corrupt election of 1876 and the end of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow segregation. He died in 1895, with victory seemingly farther away than ever. But somewhere in his dying moments, I like to think that he imagined Barack Obama and my mother's vote. Thank you. An abrazo fuerte and a spring budding bow. Thank you, Fenton. You know, that is such a beautiful, truthful and, and guiding letter. And, and honestly, I can't imagine a sort of a better ending to this town hall series and a more timely and resonant letter um, for where we're at in America today than that one. So thanks, my friend, my mentor for bringing that to us. Now, before turning to the q and I wanna remind you, you can submit some questions to the Q&A. We've got a couple, we could use a couple more. I want to announce another Dear America event, if I may. This one hosted by Seattle's Elliott Bay Books on November 10th. It will feature Washington State Attorney General Bob Ferguson, poet and essayist Shireen Sherrard, and the lovely Allison Hawthorne Deming, who is in the house tonight, who wrote the very first letter to America in our series and our book, plus me, Elizabeth Dodd, and Derek Sheffield. That's at 6 p.m. Pacific time on November 10th. That'll be 7 p.m. our time, I think, here in Tucson. Get details in the registration link at terrain.org events. And hey, don't forget, you can also purchase Dear America at 20% off using the discount code TOWNHALL, that's all caps, at dearamericabook.org. Okay, all right, one more announcement. And speaking of Dear America, I can tell you that it makes a wonderful textbook and comes with courtesy of our wonderful education editor, Janine DeBase, and terrain.org, some substantial discussion writing prompt and multimedia resources, which you can find online at terrain.org slash teach. Now, on to your questions. And here I'm going to invite Elizabeth Dodd and Derek Sheffield, since Amy and Deborah can't join us in person, to join us for this discussion as well. And both are not just the co my co-editors, but are contributors to the book as well. And so let me take a quick look at some of these uh, questions that we have. Um, let's start with a question by Susan Hansen. And I think actually that Fenton's letter addresses this head on, but let's, let's get a little more discussion on this. Given that the focus tonight is activism, my question is this, how do progressive writers actually make a difference? Can they really connect with people whose political positions oppose their own? Or are they continually preaching to the choir? Fenton, you want to tackle this one? Well, uh, that's a, a, a really great question. Um, uh, first of all, um, the choir needs to be preached to from time to time, and it uh, needs the kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, enthusiasm, the kind of reinforcement, the kind of uh, the journey has been long, the day is hot, we've run out of water, but we're still going to, we still need to press onward. So there's absolutely nothing wrong and a great deal right with um, preaching to the choir. Um, preaching as a tradition uh, is uh, well established in American letters and you, you know, you, you read um, the biographies of African American writers and you almost always find that they had a preacher in the background, James Baldwin or Neil Hurston, um, or that they were in the choir at the um, church, at the Af local African-American church. Uh, and that's where they learned their chops. Having, having said that, um, we cannot, it's just so easy to be impatient with the 
incremental nature of change. Um, I was just saying today, I, I did a Zoom group earlier today with the Senior Pride book reading group of Southern Arizona. And um, it was really fun to talk to um, queer, gay, lesbian, LGBT elders. And because one of the things I could say to them as a <laughs> gay elder was, um, look how far we've come. Look at how you and I could say that familiarly to my re to these people. Look at the way we grew up, believing that we were absolutely the only people in the world who bore this terrible affliction. Um, because I knew that everyone in the room, in their 60s and 70s and 80s and even older, knew exactly what I was talking about. And then today, Pope Francis says he thinks that. Um, there should be civil unions. It's like, what? <laughs> so um, the, 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 you, we just have to, you have to keep your shoulder to the wheel. I think James's advice is really good advice. I mean, I, I still cringe at the word deplorable because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that was the, that was the moment <clears throat> that that election was lost. And so we have to understand, you know, my cousins, my nephews, my relatives, my friends who are voting for Donald Trump, um, we have to expand our imaginations to encompass, encompass that world, not let go of the anger, not let go of our, our anger. I'll finish with something that um, wonderful thing Angela Davis said. Um, she said, you know, when People talk to her about um, the violence in the streets. She said, um, you know, I, I, my people have known nothing for, but violence for the last 400 years. And somebody's trying to talk to me with deep concern about a broken store window. I get that. But I also get that um, change doesn't come easily and people are understandably afraid of change. We need to expand our imaginations to be able to embrace where it is that they're coming from. Thank you. Elizabeth, anything you wanna respond with? Well, I think Fenton said it so thoroughly and so eloquently on, on, on both ends of the spectrum, right? So that uh, literature um, in slow time um, and a lot of culture change takes place very gradually. Uh, and it's only um, writers who are elders who can actually probably speak to that um, with a sense of, of, uh, of, of pleasure about it. And younger writers will feel great frustration um, over that fact. I agree. I, I think preaching to the choir is actually a valuable thing. Um, when it is our opposition, we see that as an aggressive act um, of, of riling up the, the core or the base, um, but we need it too. And I like to think of it as, as uplifting rather than riling up um, and, and we're all exhausted. And so having that, that sense of community and sustained intelligence and articulation that literature gives us and that writers can bring for us is a very, very valuable thing. And literature, I, I believe, um, doesn't only have a direct I-thou relationship with a single reader whom we either meet and change or we don't, but we join the larger um, ecosystem of the culture, which does move very slowly. And so, um, I think a lot of us feel an intense sense of acute time available between now and this election. Um, we feel that time was lost and squandered regarding climate change. And so we don't, it's very difficult to have the patience for the long view. Um, and so we need more than activist writers. We need activists, but the activists may take a lot of strength from the writers. We're yeah. allies in that regard. Thank you, Elizabeth. Derek, anything to add to that? You know, I do have something to add to that. Um, 
I think, first of all, I just need to say that Fenton, while you were reading, I received a text from a friend who said that your reading was making him scream in delight. So I just thought I would share that with you. Um, and then I, I actually didn't plan this tonight, Fenton, but um, I have something um, to share with you and your grandmother uh, as a nod to you, your piece and your grandmother um, right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let let me point out that that was my mother, not my my, my well, your mother, mother. Yeah, yes, your that's mother. right. My mother was born in 1916. So, <laughs> I wish I could. She died at 101, but I wish I could <laughs> send her that T-shirt. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. I kind of think I, it's. Uh, I think it was Susan's question. It's such a, a great question, and it was one of the questions that we pondered when before we even, um, you know, while we were working on the book, is this really going to help? Is this really going to make a difference? And um, uh, and and in retrospect, now, um, yes, I think it is, uh, and and I think part of uh, so much of the work is done by voices like yours, Fenton, which acknowledges um, what what your letter does and and that um, and it makes me think of um, something that I just a, a podcast that I listened to um, recently. Um, many of you I'm sure know on being with Krista Tippett and uh, Krista Tippett is a big fan of Dear America and wants you to buy multiple copies. Um, I mean, she would be if she had read it. Um, and so she had a, a woman on there, a sociologist named Arlie Hochschild, who um, had a book come out in 2016 um, about uh, sort of what Fenton is touching on in his letter and about the genuine feelings on you know, that other side and, and how they feel like they've been um, ignored and, um, uh, and talked down to. And um, so, um, you know, so part of, of this writing is, uh, you know, is listening as well. Um, this is a, this is a, um, this is something to get a conversation going. Um, so, that's what that's what Barack and I have to say. Could could I offer one more comment? I'm yeah. sorry to disappear there for a second, but I really really wanted to say the names of Nellie Jo David and Amber Ortega, who are the two Tona women Tona Odom women who laid down in front of the bulldozers. I wanted to speak their names aloud, and also to say all of what we're saying is true, but that there's the Buddhist truth here, which is um, they didn't think, I doubt it much at all about whether their lying down in front of the bulldozers was going to end the wall. They did it because it had to be done. And I think that's, that's what, that, that is what one has, one does what one must, one does what one must do, one does what one must, what must be done. I think that's a pretty stellar way to end this evening, Fenton. Thank you. Um, one does what one must do. And I think that's, that is where we're at. So I wanna thank the participants. I wanna thank the audience for joining us this evening. Fenton, thank you for being here live and Amy and Deborah uh, for being here uh, digitally speaking and Sherwin for being here in spirit. And of course, Elizabeth and Derek for joining me this evening. And again, many thanks to Trinity University Press for working with us to put this project together. Now, I know everybody here has or has already or has a plan to vote, but just as a reminder, please vote and uh, please have a wonderful evening. Go team. <laughs>